Hey everybody, this is Mr. Ganell again, and for today's lesson, which is their fifth lesson in the simple harmonic motion topic, we're going to look at the velocity and the energy at different points throughout an oscillation. I do also have the data booklet over on the right side of the screen, so we're going to refer to that a few times throughout our lesson. And one thing you're going to want to do if you're doing any calculations with me is make sure that your calculator is in radians mode. Again, that's really important for us to make sure we're in the correct mode for anything that we're doing with this topic. So the objective that we're dealing with today uh, is about energy transfers during simple harmonic mo motion, both graphically and algebraically. There are a few other IB objectives that deal with this. And again, we're in subtopic 9.1, but that's the most obvious one for this lesson. So as you scroll down, we already know when we've done some work in the last few lessons about how to find the maximum and minimum values for position, velocity, acceleration, potential energy, and kinetic energy. But we also need to make sure that we can do that at many different points throughout the oscillation, not just at the most extreme values. So I thought it would be easiest to first look at graphically what we need to do. And so I picked a graph of velocity versus time for, it really doesn't matter which type of oscillator, it's any oscillator. And we're going to look at what's going to happen. Now, one of the first things we can notice is that it goes through a full oscillation at 1.4 seconds. But for example, let's say that we wanted to know uh, what the velocity was at 0.8 seconds. So if I want to know what the velocity is there, it's actually not too bad. We just kind of follow up to look at the graph, pick that point, and then trace back over to just measure what the velocity is. It looks to be about 3 meters per second. And so I would say the velocity at 0 0.8 seconds is about three meters per second. Again, that's kind of an estimation. When we look at an IB graph, they're actually pretty good about giving us uh, a more detailed axis or more detailed grid lines so that we can measure specifically what we're looking for. Uh, right now, I'm just estimating with the graph that I'm using. So if you're given a graph, it's actually not that bad. And we can just go ahead and read off the value for the point that we're looking for. Now, algebraically, might look a little different. And in order to do that, we're going to need an equation. So since these are different depending on where the oscillator starts, what type of motion it's going through, sometimes it could be cosine, sine, positive, negative, we're going to really want to think about looking at this graph and deciding what that velocity equation is going to look like. Now, I'm going to refer to the data booklet over here. If you look at those v equations, we've got v equals omega x naught cosine of omega t, or v equals negative omega x naught sine of omega t. Now, the cosine one doesn't always have to be positive, and the sine one doesn't always have to be negative. So you're going to have to decide what's going on in your specific situation. But if you look at what's in the graph up above, I can tell that that's a negative sine graph. And so that looks more like the second equation. But the v equation is always going to be something where it's omega x naught and then either a sine or a cosine. And we can see again that this one's negative. So that's what our velocity equation would look like for this graph specifically. So if I wanted to find the velocity using the equation at 0.8 seconds, I'm going to have to do a little bit of work of finding some other values. One of the ones that I need specifically is omega. And I really don't have a good way of getting the x naught or the amplitude from this graph. But if we remember, this whole part out front is really representing v max. And so the nice thing about that is I can read actually right off the graph either at that point or that point because those values for the highest and lowest points are not the amplitude, they're the maximum and minimum velocities. So if I pick that point or that point or even this one, I can read off that it's going between extremes of positive and negative 7. And again, that's a velocity. So we're going to say that the V max is zero, whoops, seven meters per second. I should probably call that 7.0. So we can actually use that for the first part, but we still do need the omega. And if you remember for omega, that's going to be two pi over T. And I mentioned earlier in the video that our period we can look through one full cycle as 1.4 seconds. So if we go through in 2 pi, uh, 
over 1.4 seconds. That's going to end up being about 4.5 radians per second. So now that we have those values, we can actually check and see if our value matches from just looking at the graph. So we can do V equals negative, I've got 7.0 meters per second for this part. And that includes both omega and x naught. And then sine of omega, which we just calculated is 4.5 radians per second. And then we need to multiply by the time that we're actually looking for. And the time that we're looking for from the, the first part of this question is up here at 0.8 seconds. So we're going to want to use that 0 0.8 seconds. And the nice thing, if you haven't noticed this before, is that inside of that parentheses, our sine to the negative 1, oops, our sine negative seconds to the negative 1, and the seconds will cancel out, which is nice because then it leaves us radians on the inside of that parentheses. And then we really are just taking the sine of an angle. So if you do this calculation, uh, again, you want to make sure that you are in radians. And I'll do this really quickly. And we do get about 3.1 uh, if I round. It's actually not too far off of the estimation that we made up above, uh, so that at that time of 0.8 seconds, uh, we're getting pretty close to what we measured just by looking right at the graph. Uh, now again, I'm making also some estimations here that I'm assuming that this really is 7 for the highest value, so I made an estimation there too. But it should be pretty clear that whether we're doing it algebraically or graphically, we're getting about the same value of 3 meters per second there, or 3.1. Uh, again, if I had a better graph and I could read those values better, it would probably be even closer in alignment. So that's how you would use one of these graphs to find the velocity, for example. You could do the same thing with a position graph. We would just be looking at the uh, position formulas instead. Now, one other thing to mention while we have a velocity graph here is noticing what that 3 meters per second means. This is a positive 3 meters per second, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's on the positive, uh, in a positive location. One way that we could see where it's at, uh, kind of in general, we're not going to get a specific value this time, is thinking back to our topic on kinematics and what the area of this graph would represent. And so if you remember a long time ago, I said that the area between the line of the graph and the axis is going to represent our displacement. Now, if we go all the way up to that 0.8 seconds, we're going to have like a little bit of area up there. And so overall, our area is more below the axis, which means that I've had more negative displacement than I have had positive displacement. So if this is an oscillator, like uh, if that spring we've been using, for example, that means that right now it's, if I look at the equilibrium location, it's more on the, the negative side than it is on the positive side because it's had overall more negative displacement. So most likely, it's on the left side moving towards the right because it's got a positive velocity. So again, that's not really part of the question, but we should always be thinking about what else we can figure out from these graphs, one of those things being the displacement. OK. So the last thing I wanted to look at in this lesson is finding some of these values when you're not given time. Because if you've got a time graph, we can use some of the equations we've already had before and just look more specifically now and if we're not given the time. So I actually want to start this off by looking at the, uh, the energy or the total energy equation. Because when something's oscillating back and forth, our total energy is going to be the kinetic plus the potential energy. And this is sort of where our lesson ended yesterday. Now, since one of the options that I'm looking for is finding the kinetic energy, I'm just going to leave EK by itself first. And where our lesson ended yesterday, we found that formula for total energy. So I'm going to plug that back in. So our total energy is going to be 1 half m omega squared x naught squared. That's going to be equal to EK. 
plus our potential energy. And for potential energy, we know that again, this is a spring. So this is gonna be one half kx squared. Now, I'm not gonna call x here. I've been doing a lot of replacing of x naught because x naught is the amplitude. This is just by x with itself. This is any position. And so I do actually want to leave that. I don't want to figure out what's going to happen at the amplitude because then it would just be the same as what we've got uh, from the last lesson. Now, I'm trying to simplify this and eventually get to, uh, really it's no secret, this kinetic energy formula. And I notice in there that there's no K, so I'm going to try to get rid of this K. And just like we did in our last lesson, we've got omega, actually omega squared, is K over M. And so if I rearrange that and plug that in for k, we're going to get k being equal to m omega squared. And I'm going to simplify that in the next line. And we should notice that this equation on this side and this equation on this side are almost identical, except for one has a x and one has an x naught for the amplitude. So if I subtract those over, all right, I'm really going to subtract this one over. You're going to subtract and combine like terms at the same time. So I'm going to get 1 half m omega squared. And then in parentheses, x naught squared minus x squared. And that's our kinetic energy at any specific position. And that's how we get this equation over here. Of ek is 1 half m omega squared amplitude squared minus the position squared. Now, I also did say that I wanted to be able to find the velocity at any point, which is the equation right above it. Oops. So the equation right above it actually just follows on to the next step. If I want to solve for what the V is, then I'm going to have to go through, and here, let me highlight this because this is a good stopping point. Uh, I'm going to keep going. Since, like I said, I wanted to find out what the V is, we'll replace kinetic energy with its formula. We've got one half mv squared, and then the other side will still remain. And then I've got some things that are going to cancel out. So there's a half on both sides, you can multiply both sides by two. There's an m on both sides that will also cancel out. And then we're going to simplify a little bit further. We've got v squared equals omega squared x naught squared minus x squared. And then the last thing that we can do is to take the square root. Now, remember, of course, that when we take the square root, we're going to get a positive or negative value. And that's where the plus or minus comes from over here in this equation, is that this is going to be plus or minus omega, because we've square rooted that. And then I have to square root the entire x naught squared minus x squared. And that will be how we find our velocity at any point. And again, these are both if you're not given time, but are given the location where something is at, and we want to know what the kinetic energy is. Or, in this case, the, when we further derive what the velocity is.